you. <laughs> right, um, I think most of you in the room know me, know what I, know what I do, what I did. Um, one of my um, pet um, things in this case is the, ca is the Carousel Club, and all the strippers there, and Jack Ruby, and some weird and wonderful characters. And early on in my study of this, I learned that there was a girl there who danced regularly called Kathy Kay. Um, and she was just another of the strippers. And I found out that she was actually born in London, in Edgeware. So that made her of greater interest to me, because another of my interests are the, the British connections in this case, and there are a lot of them. So this is a young lady that you, you may know her by the name Kathy Kay, or maybe Kathy uh, Kay Coleman, she became or K. Helen Olsen, this is all the same person. But how many of you know that she began life in Edgeware, London in 1936 with the name Lillian Helen Harvey? That's Kathy Kay. I'll be delighted to take questions at the end of the paper, but I must warn you that some of my sources have to remain anonymous. Some of them involve people in high places, sensitive positions or authority on both sides of the big pond. I, ha I like to think I have a reputation as someone who goes back to primary sources whenever they can and I like to share those primary sources whenever I can. In this case, it may not be possible. Now, when I, I say, when I first undertook to study this lady, it was because of her name, uh, well, sorry, I think I, because I knew that she'd been born in London. Right. I began inquiring about Kathy Kay. A lot of people said, oh, she's dead. Been dead for years. Well, I, I didn't... I didn't take that as, um, as definite, so I thought, well, I'm, I'm still going to try and find out. Rumours about her, she danced with Lee Harvey Oswald in the Carousel Club. Well, if that's true, that's, that's dynamite. She'd married a Dallas cop, a stripper marrying a Dallas cop. They'd then fled the, the state and gone to California. It was all interesting things, and as far as I know, nobody had studied these aspects of her before. Um, so, working purely from some very sketchy descriptive information from an Oklahoma City FBI report, which I hope is up there. Now, those, that is an exact copy from the Commission Exhibit, Commission Exhibit 1480, including the misspelling of Edgeware. That's the Oklahoma City people, isn't it? Um, where is he? Oh, he's, he's, yeah, there he is. That's Oklahoma City, isn't it? <laughs> but there you see, um, her ex-husband is a guy called Kenner, Kenner Joseph Coleman. That's all they know. They were divorced. And she is, her citizenship, she's still English, but she's married, she's entered the United States as the wife of this man. So that is the first district, the first stuff I got um, about Cathy. Now, I got onto the family records office in London and various other places. It wasn't easy, it takes a long time, but eventually I managed to find and, and acquire this document. Now this is the most important document I've got in my Kathy K collection. This is her birth certificate. <coughs> it gives her, um, let's see if we can highlight these. It gives her a date of birth, which is in 1936. And she's born at 85, Dryfield Road, Edgware, in the urban district of Hendon. Her name is Lillian, Lillian Helen, and her surname is Harley. There we are. And she's a girl. Well, good. Um, her, fa her father, is um, J is uh, the, the storekeeper in the photographic works. T J F Harvey, the mother, has registered the birth. Just a normal birth certificate, but it's, it's, there's a lot of information there, including the, the date of birth, eight, um, April 1936. So this is the start. This is where we, where we begin with this. Now, where are we? That is the house where she was born. <coughs> Doesn't look much now, but I believe in 1936 this was quite a well-to-do area of London. Uh, it's now become quite run down. There's the house. Um, a fairly new house. Though. A big one? Would have been a fairly new house. In, in the 30s, Mike, yes it would. The family lived there. She was born there. They moved out to Southend-on-Sea, as did a lot of people after the war from these areas of London, and they, they lived there from 1952, the family. Now, on June the 5th, 1954, less than two months after her 18th birthday, at this time they're living in, in South End, Lillian married Kenard Joseph Coleman. And she married him at that church in South End on Sea, Essex. And that is the house that she'd been living in with her parents when she, she met and married him. 
I'm going back with her. Oh, there we are. And that is the wedding certificate. And that this is another important document because it gives us a lot of information. If any of you people have ever traced your family trees, you know how much you can get from documents like this. Um, the 5th of June 1954, his name is Kenard Joseph Coleman, formerly known as Davis, I don't know what that's about. He, was, he is 24 years old, he's a bachelor, and his rank or profession, Staff Sergeant AF, I can't, I can't see the number, United Sorry. States Air Force. And he's, um, he's at the uh, RAF station Wethersfield, which is actually United States Air Force Base. She is 18 years old, she's six years his junior, spinster, and she's working uh, as a buncher, B-U-N-C-H-E, a buncher in an artificial flowers factory. And that's her home address. What is not shown on this document is at the time she was three months pregnant. Um, at one stage, in fact, for a period of about four years, I was under the impression, through some erroneous information I received, that Kennard was what we now call an African-American. And I thought, wow, if she's pregnant by an African-American in, 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 in England at this time, that is going to cause big problems. But that was wrong information, and she was never, he, he was not black, he was a white guy, uh, originally from Chicago. Now, a bunch of an artificial flower factory, we, we couldn't let this go. Uh, back in the 1950s, we, we did a lot of research on this. When I say we, I'm talking about myself and uh, Melanie, Melanie Swift, who's my corroborator on a lot of this. Back in the early 50s, there had been nearly a dozen firms in the South End area engaged in this type of work, but they have now all ceased trading. I found out what the work entailed. The raw materials were not flowers, in the usual sense, but different coloured seaweeds which had been gathered locally and were simply dried, tied up in bunches and sold for house ornaments. Now, as, I, as we'll see later on, we go into her education. This was not the right sort of job for someone like uh, Lillian. Okay, in her Warren Commission testimony, when asked about her education, Lillian said, Oh, I went to an all-girls school. I won a scholarship to an, er an all-girls school. What she was referring here to was the forerunner of the 11 plus. I believe it was just called the scholarship. And when you passed it at age 10 or 11, you were invited to entry into the local grammar school. Now, the all, all, girl, all girls school she mentioned was Orange Hill School for Girls at Edgware. Now, this school's best known former pupil was the film actress Jean Simmons, some seven years before Cathy. So, this was a good school. Um, in 1971, following educational reforms, Orange Hill School for Girls was swallowed up by the much larger co-educational Mill Hill County High School. Now, I've got a lot of good information from the current school secretary who was very good with this, but I was very careful not to mention that the former pupil I was studying had ended up as a stripper in Dallas. Now, uh, off on a tangent, the most famous ex-pupil of Mill Hill County High was a guy called Baz Burra. Now, who's heard of Baz Burra? That many. He's a guitarist, much in demand as a session player, and he's a former member of Adam and the Ants. Now initially I was perplexed how a teenage girl in Thorpe Bay near South End would have come to meet a member of the United States Air Force living on a base 50 miles north. However, with the help of a former DP UK member from Shubaness, Barbara Carlion, I established with 99% certainty that young Lillian Helen Harvey had met Staff Sergeant Coleman at one of the regular weekend dances at the base when teenage girls from the surrounding towns and villages were bussed in to provide dance partners. Barbara, I think Barbara may have been mixed up in this in her younger days, because she told me that the, that, that vehicle was known as the Pig Bus. So, work it out for yourselves. I visited and photographed the Edgware House, the Thorpe Bay House, the Roman Catholic Church where they'd been married, uh, where the incumbent, Father Lavin, was very helpful, and I, I was able to study the original documents um, of the marriage. Now, as a married man, Star Sergeant Coleman was allowed to live off base. The newly married couple moved into a house called Talma in Braintree Road in the Essex village of Felsted, about 12 miles away from the base where he, he was, he was um, working. I was, I've been unable to establish whether it was privately rented by the couple or provided as a married quarter by the USAF. Um, it, no longer, it no longer exists. Um, one of my good friends in that area, a former woman police sergeant, um, who's now got an MBE by the way, uh, carried out inquiries on my behalf and, and there's nothing left there now. 
Their first child, the Colmer's first child, a daughter they called Su Susan Helen, was born at St John's Maternity Hospital, 48 Wood Street, Chelmsford, Essex, on the 12th of December 1954. Kathy Kay's first daughter was an Essex girl. You're supposed to cheer, come on. <laughs> okay, 14th of May 1956. Just under two years after their marriage, Kenard and Lillian Coleman left England for the United States. They lived initially at Victoria in Texas. Coleman was still serving in the USAF, and so it's reasonable to assume that this was part of his job. He was actually a technician working on F-100 Super Savers. Um, just this morning, I think it was, Larry, I was talking to Larry about this, and Larry is ex-USAF, and he said that to be in that position at the age of 24 was very, very unusual. It usually, you were usually about 30 before you even reached that rank. So there was something maybe a bit strange going on. The Colmans had a second daughter they called Sherry. And she was born in Texas around August 1957. Less than a year later, however, the couple split up. They separated. Lillian retained custody of the children and moved to Riverside, California. Kenard, still serving in the USAF, went to Illinois. I believe he transferred to Scott Air Force Base where there was an F-100 squadron. They, they reunited briefly that year when Lillian and the children joined Canada in Illinois. They then moved to Kansas together, living initially in Salina at the Schilling Air Force Base, and then in Wichita, possibly the McConnell Air Force Base. During this period, Canada was in very poor health, and this may have been the main reason for their brief reconciliation. The situation was not to last, however, and they divorced. Lillian cited Canada for extreme cruelty and gross neglect of duty towards her. I have copies of the relevant district court of Saline County, Kansas divorce documents in the case of Lillian H. Coleman, plaintiff, and Kenneth Coleman, defendant, case number 22561. Lillian was awarded custody of the two children and Kenneth was ordered to pay a reasonable sum per month for the support of said party's minor children. The divorce case was filed in the district court of Saline County, Kansas on the 1st of December, 59. The divorce was finalized from 11th of December, 1961. At that time, however, Lillian had already moved back to Texas. Now, like much of the, pers the personal information contained here, these details have come from the Warren Commission testimony of K. Helen Olson. I'm obliged to Kansas researcher Mark Colgan, who has located records indicating that Kenneth Coleman died in Harris County, Texas, on the 1st of May 1969. He never remarried, was just 39 years old. Cause, cause of death not known. And so did Dallas. Together with her two children, now aged six and four, Lillian moved to Dallas in June 1961. The reason? Not clear, don't know, don't know why she went there. Initially, she found employment as a waitress at Barney Weinstein's Theatre Lounge. Now, that was also a strip club, but she's there as a waitress. The following month, she went to work as a stripper at Jack Ruby's Carousel Club, and Mrs. Lillian Helen Coleman became Kathy Kay. According to her Warren Commission testimony, she was introduced to Ruby when she just went up to his club to see some girlfriends. Now, who these girlfriends were, I have no clue. Were they on Ruby, Ruby's payroll? Were they already strippers? I just don't know. But she was introduced to them. She's now working with Ruby, taking her clothes off about 21, 21 times a, a week. Now, in his Warren Commission testimony, a guy called Norman Earl Wright, professional name Earl Norman, explained that he had worked at the Carousel Club from June 1961 as an MC, comedian and singer. When asked if Kathy Kay was working for Ruby when he worked for them, he said, yes, in fact we started her off as a professional entertainer when I was there. She did a couple of amateur shows and then he put her to work as a regular dancer. Wright also said that he believed that at the time of the assassination, Kathy Kay had worked for Ruby longer than any other dancer. Apart from a brief spell in 1962 when she worked at the Colony Club, Kathy, as I shall now call her, Continue, continued to work for Ruby right up to the eve of the assassination. The Carousel Club advertisement in the Dallas Times Herald of 22nd November names her as one of five exotics due to the stage, due on stage that evening. That performance, of course, never took place because Jack Ruby didn't open the club following the killing of the president. Now, Kathy Kay was one of the most popular of Ruby's girls. She was tall, she was slim, she was blonde, she was very pretty. Most important, she had something that stood her apart from all the other Carousel Club performers, an English accent. Several former patrons of the Carousel Club have told me that Cathy would often talk to the audience when she was on stage. This was to become an accepted part of her act, almost a trademark. Cathy Kay had no need to incorporate balloons, feathers, snakes, all the rest of it into her act. Her natural speaking voice became her gimmick. 
just to go off on a tangent for a moment, you may be interested to learn that the foremost exotic snake act at the carousel was a stripper who performed under the name of Tony Turner. Her real name was Joan Lavelle, and by a strange quirk of fate, DPD Detective Jim Lavelle was the uncle of her estranged, her estranged husband. In a tape recorded interview in November 1994, the former carousel club feature stripper Charlie Angel, who a lot of you have met and know, talked to me about her friend Kathy. She told me she was English, she was my pal, she spoke a lot of Cockney. Now Charlie was unable, was, oh, sorry, was unaware that true Cockneys do not originate from that part of London where, where this lady had been born. The remark was quite an interesting one, however. Now I have a San Jose FBI report of 8th of September 1975 describing an interview seven years earlier when, quote, Mrs. Coleman, that's Kathy Kay, said that during her act on the stage, the twist was in style at this time, and she would call a customer to come up on the stage, and she would show this customer how to do the twist. In September 1999, a photograph circulated on Rich De La Rosa's JFK forum, which showed Kathy Kay in the carousel club, that's doing exactly that. The intriguing part of this picture, however, is the customer to whom she's giving a twist lesson is a very young looking Jim Mars. At this time, the future author of the book Crossfire was a college student at North Texas State University at Denton and was obviously enjoying a night out studying something far more interesting than his normal coursework. In November 1999, I showed the picture to Jim Mars he con and he confirmed, or should we say admitted, that he is indeed the man shown. At that time, he was 18 years old. Enter DPD patrolman Harry Olson. Despite the protestations of the Warren Commission investigators to the contrary, it is now plain that the Carousel Club and similar clubs in Dallas were indeed regular haunts for many off-duty police officers. One such officer was Harry Neil Olson, a patrolman and member of the headquarters station staff within the patrol division of the Dallas Police Department. He became a regular visitor to the Carousel Club from early 1963 onwards, DPD records indicate that he had been born on the 16th of February 1934 at Wichita Falls and had been a Dallas cop since the middle of 1958. I've only seen one very, very sketchy photograph of Olsen, but Margaret Ruth Ritchie, a Carousel Club wait waitress, told the commission that he was a real tall guy, nice built. <laughs> Olsen claimed that he'd first met Jack Ruby during a routine police check of the club in 1961 and that he became a regular patron. During his Warren Commission testimony, he told Arnold Inspector that he was going with or steadily dating Kay, then from the early fall of 1963 on up until the time he married her. During an, F an FBI interview on 10th of December 1963, however, Kathy said that she had dated Olsen on a regular basis for over a year and that she and Olsen had discussed marriage, but due to her occupation, no wedding plans had been made. What this meant was that, and she said this, we couldn't marry because of me working and, you know, the police department, the wives couldn't work in a place like that, you know. <laughs> At this time, Kathy was a divorcee, Olsen was separated from his wife and awaiting for his divorce to come through, which it did in October 63. Perhaps the latter fact was influential in Oswald claiming that his close liaison with Kathy was much shorter than it really was. Jack Ruby had no objection to one of his star performers dating a policeman. In fact, he welcomed it. He probably looked upon it as another small but important factor in his, his uh, constant efforts to maintain good relations with the boys in blue. Kathy would normally dance seven nights a week and also would be there to watch her on at least one of those nights, usually more. He very seldom missed her Saturday night performance. Although Ruby and Olsen did not particularly like one another, Ruby came to trust Olsen's judgment and would sometimes consult him when he had personal problem. In other words, when he wanted someone checked out. Not chucked out, he did that himself. In her Warren Commission testimony, Kay mentioned that she sometimes had disagreements with Ruby over her getting time off to see Olsen. It seems that the cop and the club owner got to know one another without becoming close friends. As I will explain later, I know of at least one occasion on which they went ice skating together, with far-reaching consequences. During this period, 63, Kathy was renting apartment 111 at 325 North Ewing Street, Oak Cliff, a modern two-storey apartment block. I have been told by Johnny Calvin Brewer, one of her ex-neighbours, that she and, she and her two daughters were well liked in the immediate apartment complex and they were joining the usual communal activities at the pool and the barbecue area. Kathy's employment at the Carousel Club was no secret and neither did it carry any social stigma. 
One interesting but unsubstantiated report I picked up here is that Cathy was visited at her apartment by Lee Harvey Oswald at least twice. Unfortunately, however, this comes to me by a third party and I have to treat it with a great deal of care and suspicion. Lack of corroboration also dictates that I treat it now with total disbelief. The late Mary Farrell deep delved deep into her records for me and advised that Harry Olson was sharing a home with DPD motorcycle officer Bobby Joe Dale at 3615 Theatre Lane at this time. This was close to the Lemon Avenue Turtle Creek Boulevard intersection in the Oak Cliff district of Dallas, two miles north of downtown. To complicate things even further, Bobby Dale, this is a cop, Bobby Dale's wife, a stewardess with American Airlines, was living in the very next apartment to Jack Ruby under her maiden name. This was allegedly a ruse to get around the, the American Airlines rule which forbade the employment of married women as stewardesses. This may, be, this may well be true, but for the wife of a serving cop to end up living literally next door to Ruby and using her married name, whoops. At least some of the time, I understand that Harry stayed with Cathy at her apartment. I believe this was the situation on the day of the assassination, although Cathy herself denied it. In the preamble to an FBI report of an interview with Olsen on the 16th of December 1963, his address is shown as 325 North Ewing Street, Dallas. That's Cathy's apartment block. From her Warren Commission testimony, it's obvious that Cathy K got on well with Jack Ruby. He visited her several times her apartment, uh, strictly on club business. She also pointed out that he, entertained, that he entertained all the employees at his own apartment on the 4th of July each year. He lived at apartment 207 on 223 South Ewing Street, about half a mile from Cathy. We now come up to the day of the assassination. Cathy Kay worked at the Carousel Club on the evening of the Thursday, the thir Thursday the 21st of November, as usual. Later, she could not recall what she did the following morning, but surmised that after getting up at mid-morning, she had been by the pool with her children. She then visited Harry Olsen at an estate just a ways from where I lived. I feel it strange, I, I feel that this strange incident of Olsen allegedly having a garden job at an estate is well known to you all, so I've got time going to hear. Patrolman Olsen was off duty at this time, having broken his kneecap several weeks before. He was forced to wear a cast on his injured leg and he walked with the aid of crutches. When asked by the Warren Commission's Arnold Inspector, what sort of accident did you have to injure your leg? Olsen simply replied, I fell and broke my kneecap. Now, had Assistant Counsel Spectre pursued that line of inquiry, he would have learnt the exact circumstances of that fall. It had occurred when Jack Ruby, Cathy Kay, Shari Angel and Officer Olsen had been ice skating together at Fair Park. Ruby had accidentally crashed into Olsen on the ice, run over his leg and seriously injured his, his kneecap. Both Harry Olsen and Cathy Kay remained strangely reticent about their actions on the afternoon of the assassination. The location of the estate which Olsen maintained he was guarding has never positively been identified. He claimed to remember it only as on 8th Street in Dallas. At about 1.15pm, Cathy telephoned the Carousel Club and was told by Andy Armstrong, the barman and general help, that the club would not open that evening. She then sat with her landlady, Mrs Hall, presumably watching the unbroken coverage on, the t on TV. On completion of his guarding job, Harry arrived home at just after 6pm according to her, or 8pm according to him. They then watched television together. Later that evening, Cathy and Harry drove in his car to Dealey Plaza to see where the President was shot. Then came one of those unexplained and possibly unexplainable incidents with which this affair abounds. At around midnight, they were sitting in the parked car just outside Simon's Garage, a parking garage on the corner of Jackson and Field in downtown Dallas. They met Jack Ruby. Whether this was a chance meeting or a pre-arranged rendezvous has never been established. According to Olson's testimony, he then spoke with Ruby for two or three hours in the company of Kathy Kay. In her, ver in her version, the conversation went on for an hour or so at least. And a Dallas FBI report of an interview with Olsen while he was in hospital on the 12th of December, however, stated that he claimed the conversation had lasted for about 10 minutes. So Ruby says two or three hours, blah, 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 blah. Olsen says about 10 minutes. In his Warren Commission testimony, Jack Ruby stated, I left the KLIF, that's the local radio station, at 2am and spent an hour with the officer and his girlfriend. 
I feel that a discrepancy in time of this magnitude between 10 minutes and 3 hours de <laughs> demands close examination, but it just went unchallenged and unchecked. It also appalls me that no conscious effort seems to have been made to determine what they actually discussed in this period. It was during this conversation that Cathy Clay was said to have passed the remark about the alleged assassin Olsen, well if he was in England they would drag him through the streets and would have hung him. Now, in their Warren Commission testimony, both she and Olsen denied that she ever used those or similar words. I'm inclined to accept these denials as, as this expression is not one that would come naturally from a Londoner, even one who's been living in the United States for seven years. Nothing remarkable appears to have happened to Cathy Kay the following day, Saturday the 23rd. However, in his Warren Commission testimony, Olsen stated that he and Cathy spent the day together and they watched some television and listened to the radio a little bit. In the evening, they drove to where the President was shot uh, several times and drove around town a little. He then took Cathy to her apartment around 2 or 3 in the morning and claimed that he could not recall where he spent that night. Well, I can, I can tell you, I can tell you where he spent that night, it's obvious. He said, I could have slept on her couch. Either that or I went back to my apartment. Oh, rubbish. He was in bed with her, of course he was. Ruby shoots Olsen. At about 11.30 on the morning of Sunday the 24th, Cathy was awoken by one of her daughters who simply told her, Jack just shot Oswald. According to her, te uh, her testimony, at about 4 o'clock that afternoon, she and Harry Holm, uh, she and, oh, Harry Holm, she and Harry Olsen drove to Henrietta, Texas, that's up near Wichita Falls, to visit Harry's parents. She described the mysterious Henrietta trip in some detail. As well as Harry's parents, she and Harry visited another friend of the family, who was also called Harry. She did not say exactly who he was or why they met him, and Spectre never bothered to ask. It would be interesting to learn the reason for this Henrietta visit. Since Cathy worked seven nights a week at the Carousel Club, it would normally have, she would normally have expected to work this night as usual. So was this a spur of the moment visit? It has been suggested to me that Harry may have been trying to obtain money from his parents to, forth to finance his forthcoming marriage to Cathy. Taking a somewhat more sinister view, however, could it have been an attempt to obtain money to help them skip town? Olsen's father was a religious man, and he was unaware of his future daughter-in-law's occupation. Leaving Henrietta at around 10, 10, uh, 10 o'clock that evening, uh, that night, Cathy and Harry drove back to Dallas. Cathy had a driver's license at this time, and in view of Henry's of, of Harry's leg, his injury, it's almost certain that she drove the car on this 320-mile round trip. For some unexplained reason, Harry Olsen failed to mention anything about the, the Henrietta trip in his own testimony. He said that he had stayed at Cathy's house with her children for several hours and left at, say, 9 or 10 o'clock, when they drove around Dallas yet again before returning to her apartment. Uh, incidentally, this testimony was taken at the same venue in Los Angeles and by the same Warren Commission Assistant Counsel, Arlen Spectre, less than two hours after Cathy's, so these things should have been picked up by Spectre. Two days later, Tuesday the 26th of November, after obtaining clearance from the Union, the American Guild of Variety Artists, Cathy Kay collected her costumes, back pay and personal effects from the Carousel Club. Tom Palmer, the Union branch manager in Dallas, told the Warren Commission that Cathy had indicated to him that she was frightened and wanted to get out of town as quickly as possible. He claimed that he did not know the reason for this. Strangely enough, Palmer also performed at the Carousel Club as an occasional magician and chameleon. In an FBI interview in August 1978, Olsen claimed that Cathy, by then his ex-wife, had been scared by something Ruby told her. Although he claimed to know what it was, Olsen would never reveal what it was. By the 2nd of December, Cathy was working as a stripper at the King's Club in Oklahoma City <coughs> because she wanted to make some money for Christmas. Another of Ruby's ex-strippers, Nancy Monell Powell, stage name Tammy True, was living at room 6 in the Siesta Motel there, Oklahoma City, and Cathy stayed with her for three weeks. This motel was owned by Jake Samara, an associate of Jack Ruby. This seems a strange arrangement to me since Charlie Angel had said that Cathy and Tammy True fought like cats and dogs. They loathed each other. If you'd go in the bathroom, they'd be socking it out. I have no idea what arrangements Cathy had made for her children at this time. Harry Olsen, who remained in Dallas, suffered multiple injuries when he was involved in a mysterious car crash on the 7th of December. His car was a total wreck after a collision with a, te a telegraph pole. No other vehicle involved, he was alone in the car. It has been suggested that this could have been an attempt on his life. I feel it can just as easily be dismissed as a result of him losing control of the vehicle. He's still his leg in plaster at this time. On the other hand, as Larry has suggested to me, it could have been a warning. Harry then spent two weeks in Methodist Hospital Oak Cliff. 
He stated in his Warren Commission testimony that he was visited here by Jack Ruby's ex-Carousel Club employee Wally Weston, that's also Shari Angel's husband. No reason for this mysterious visit has ever come up. Now we come to something very important and something very new. Since Harry Olsen was still unfit for normal police duties and had used up all his allowable sick time, he was discharged from the Dallas Police Department on health grounds on the 29th of December 1963. Now, just last week, fri Friday of last week, I was given certain information about Harry Olsen's DPD discharge and there's documentation on this and it's on its way to me. Basically this, this information is that he had used up all his allowable sick time. That's not true. His extended period of sick leave was used as a convenient reason to kick him out. The facts are these. A few months earlier, Harry had been approached by a female acquaintance, a member of the public, who wanted him to check, out, check up on somebody else through official police files. Obviously this is completely illegal and it the rules. However, Harry agreed to do it and demanded a $50 fee. Harry pocketed the cash and did nothing. He thought he was fireproof and the lady would not dare make an official complaint. Wrong. She went to the top. She went to Chief of Police Jesse Curry and lodged an official complaint that Harry had conned her out of 50 bucks. <coughs> Harry was investigated but let off with a severe warning. From then on, however, Curry was looking for an excuse to kick him off the force. Harry's extended sick leave, though legitimate, provided just the excuse. 29th, De 29th December 1963, goodbye Harry. This period of Kathy's life presents a few problems. There is a record of an FBI interview with Wally Weston in Florida, 3rd of September 76, during which it was suggested that Kathy had been present at a meeting of ex Ruby employees approximately three weeks after the shooting of Kennedy. The venue of this meeting is not mentioned, but as I've just pointed out, my research for Kathy, with Kathy puts her in Oklahoma City at this time. In the course of this interview, Weston said that during the meeting, he was talking with Kathy Kay in the presence of Billy Willis, a drummer, about Jack Ruby killing Lee Harvey Oswald. Kay told him that she had danced with the man who killed the president about one week before the shooting. She is saying that she danced with Oswald a week before he shot to Kennedy. Whether this is true or not, we don't know. The next definite event I've established is Kathy's, Kathy Kay's marriage to Harry Neil Olsen. They had changed marriage license 06960 on the 10th of January 1964 and were married at the Rosemount Christian Church in Dallas on the 18th of January 64. I visited the church with Mark Rowe, which is situated at 1304 Southampton in Dallas on the 18th of November 1999. The current pastor was very obliging but was unable to add anything of significance other than to inform us that the, the relevant records are now housed at the Dallas Courts building. Since Olsen no longer had his police job, there was nothing to keep the newlyweds in Dallas and they fulfilled an ambition to move to California. They used the financial settlement from Olsen's car insurance claim and some money which Kathy had managed to save from her job at the King's Club. When asked by Arlen Spector, was there any special reason you went to California? Olsen pr produced a flippant reply, we heard the climate was nice out there. So <laughs> Arlen Spector just leaves it at that. The Olsons, together with Kathy's two daughters by her previous marriage, moved from Dallas to apartment 2, uh, 1260 2nd Avenue, Long Beach, California, on the 1st of February 1964. Later in the year, they moved to apartment 12 at 315 Apiso Avenue, still in Long Beach, and were reported to be running a company called the Doctor's Business Bureau, from room what, 1006, uh, 19 Pine Avenue, Long Beach. Efforts to find out more about this business have been unsuccessful. God knows what they were doing with that. So this lady, Lillian Helen Harvey, Kay Helen Coleman, Kathy Kay, had now become Mrs. Kay Helen Olson. That's the name under which she testified before Spectre of the Warren Commission on the 6th of August 64 in, in, in LA. Um, although she's lived in a succession of different addresses on and along the coastline of California since then, I don't think she's ever, ever left the state. As well as the two Long Beach addresses, I've located records showing that she's lived in San Jose, Campbell, Riverside, Santa Cruz and Sunnyvale. In addition, she now lives in Northern California, an address which I will not divulge. The marriage between former stripper Kathy Kay and the ex-cop Harry Olsen was not to last, but I've been unable to establish exactly when it ended or the circumstances. I'm unaware that they had any children together. I have, however, succeeded in tracing the name of her third and current husband, together with the address where they have lived for the past 12 years, maybe longer. I also have a telephone number. 
I am sworn not to divulge these details. As far as I'm aware, the only researchers who know them are a close and confidential contact in Kansas, who was instrumental in tracking this information down, two colleagues in California, another in Dallas, and my good friend and collaborator Melanie Swift here in England. Harry Olson is also still living in California, and like his former wife, he is not at all keen to meet people like you and I. One well-known and respected California researcher tracked him down to a small town about 60 miles northeast of Los Angeles, but even as she climbed out of her car, he was at the front door with a rifle. Right, an unsatisfactory ending to all this. There's only one way I wanted all this research to end. I wanted to fly out to the great state of California and meet this lady. On the 30th of June 1995, I flew, from San I flew to San Francisco via Dallas, Texas and Albuquerque to take part in a live TV show, Assassination Update, being hosted by our good friend Hal Verb. This would be the obvious, obvious opportunity for me to get out and meet this lady. A few months prior to the, the California visit, I'd spoken with Beverly Oliver in Dallas. During her time as a singer at the Colony Club, literally next door to the Carousel Club, Beverly had got to know Kathy Clay and they'd become good friends. Beverly very kindly gave me a copy of her recently published uh, autobiography, Nightmare in Dallas, inside which she wrote a personal note to Kathy, and it closed with the statement, you can trust Ian Griggs with anything. We both hoped that this would help to put Kathy at her ease when I met her. When I arrived in San Francisco, I stayed at a very pleasant motel close to the marina, marina, <laughs> just a mile from the Golden Gate Bridge. I had still not attempted to make contact with the ex Kathy Kay. I was quickly on the telephone hoping to reach her. I must have telephoned a dozen or more times, but all I got was an answer phone. This provided a very strange message spoken by her current husband, Stephen, and it did confirm I had the right number. Her current maiden name was mentioned and part of, uh, sorry, her current and her, her current married name was mentioned and part of the recorded message referred to her as Kay. Furthermore, the message concluded with her laughing in the background. Despite leaving my name and telephone number and address of my motel, I received nothing back from either Kathy or her husband. I even sent her a letter explaining who I was, where I was, my reason for being in San Francisco, and in an effort to establish my bona fides, I enclosed a few photographs of the house that she'd been born, uh, the church where she was married, and etc. Maybe she watched my TV appearance, I don't know. One evening, a couple of days before I was due to fly back to Dallas and then home, I did receive a, a telephone call at my motel room. The caller was an unidentified male American, and it was not Kathy Kay's husband. This voice simply told me that the lady does not want to meet you, and it would be best if you pack your bag and return to England as soon as you can, or worse to that effect. Despite having met some fairly shady characters during my, res my, my assassination research, not to mention my police career, I'd never experienced anything like this. I knew exactly what it, went, what it meant, however, and I took it very seriously. I immediately cancelled my plans to drive out into the desert to try to meet the lady, and I spent my last two days in San Francisco playing the innocent tourist. I wandered the city's many attractions, visited Haight-Ashbury to pay homage to Janis Jack Joplin and Jefferson Airplane, I walked the bridge, I took the bay tour, I ate at the Hard Rock Cafe, and I rode those incredible cable cars. I even spent a few hours at City Hall trying to trace the records of my great-grandfather who had lost his life in the 1906 earthquake. Then I flew home. I certainly made no further attempt to contact the lady who had begun her life as, Helen, as, as Lillian Helen Harvey in Edgware, London back in 1936. That was it. Maybe I'll try again someday, maybe I won't. We just closed with a few rumours. Rumours abound about this lady, and as is so often the case, most of them are just that, rumours. Despite Wally Weston's uncorroborated claim made to the FBI in 1976, there is no proof or confirmation that Kathy Kay ever danced with Lee Harvey Oswald. She later denied she ever saw him in there. There is nothing to substantiate stories that Lee Harvey Oswald saw Kathy Kay dance at the Carousel Club, he became infatuated with her and visited her apartment. There is nothing to give credence to a story that circulated a few years ago to the effect that she may have been the blonde lady in her mid-twenties who was reportedly seen to drop a paper bag containing a pistol somewhere in the immediate vicinity of the assassination. This was alleged to have occurred within minutes of the shots in Dealey Plaza. A full account is in uh, Gary Shaw's article in the Dateline Dallas, A Smoking Gun for the Grassy Knoll. There is nothing to suggest that she was in any way implicated in the assassination of President Kennedy or the murders of J.D. Tippett or Lee Harvey Oswald. As I have proved, there is no truth in the rumour that she is dead.
The subject of this paper is alive and well and living the good life in relative luxury in Northern California. She is now 69 years old and has absolutely no wish to be found and interviewed by you or I. Her husband Stephen is a millionaire. He has an Italian sounding surname but an American voice which seems to have a touch of Welsh about it. Perhaps in her mature years, the lady who captivated the Dallas nightlife of the early 60s with her English accent has reverted to her European roots. A final thought. Now like Alaric, I've got a bizarre possibility. Mine's more bizarre than yours. Perhaps Lillian, Kathy, Kay, what do you want to speak, what do you want to call her, who has obviously married well at last, has become alarmed at my attempts to contact her. Perhaps the scary phone call I received was at her instigation. Perhaps she is concerned that her husband could learn of her life as a stripper at the notorious Carousel Club. As fellow stripper Tammy Trues told the Warren Commission, she had this boyfriend that she had been going with that was a policeman, this is Olsen, and they were going to get married. And his parents didn't know that she was an exotic. And her parents didn't know that she was an exotic, this is a stripper. And she didn't want her parents to know that she is an exotic dancer. Perhaps her husband doesn't know. Acknowledgements, lots of them. I've acknowledged a lot of people here uh, to, to what to helped me in this paper, including Malcolm Blunt over there, Bob Shaw, Melanie Swift, and in America, the late Mike Blackwell, late Mary Farrell, Jim Mars, Martha Moyer, some of you know in Dallas, Rachel Rendish, Gary Shaw, Russ Shearer, Hal Verb, Nancy Wafer, Jack White, and Betty Windsor. And several acquaintances of hers have helped me. Beverly Oliver, Shari Angel, Johnny Calvin Brewer have been very helpful. Some excellent photographs of Kathy Kay working, in other words, ripping off all her clothes, can be found in the Warren Commission 26 volumes. I succeeded in obtaining copies of those that were censored by the Warren Commission. They censored some and banned them for being of questionable taste and negligible relevance. And by today's standards, they appear perfectly acceptable to me. Judge for yourself. Up at the top, the, the, the top two rows, I put a small exhibit of pictures, documents, etc. Um, so you can judge them for yourselves. Uh, I'm sorry this has been a bit of a rush, but uh, time is of the essence. That's all I've got. Ar answers to questions. Yep, I've got a short Kathy K timeline for you, um, which I'll give out. But any questions, fire away. That's an easy one, isn't it, Larry? <laughs> Thank you very much for being a priest. Thanks. Right, Tony, do we need these vouchers again this year? If you actually choose one, uh, please do. They're all there for you to have a look at. Right, the final thing of the evening. I said earlier. Just simply turn this off. Get rid of that, yeah. That I'd have a few more words to say about Ian. <coughs> Ian, would you come down to the front and sit yourself on this chair? I think you're going to need to sit down. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Just make yourself comfortable there. I've got to sit here, right? Yeah. If you thought we was going to let the fact that you retired from <laughs> no. as secretary from Dealey Plaza UK without uh, uh, marking it on in some special way, you were mistaken. The water would come down. I don't know if I'm following following the rules of the constitution of the group to the letter, but I don't I don't care anyway. Um, I propose that we should uh, make Ian a life member of the group in recognition. <laughs> for all that he has done as secretary and all that you're going to continue to do the group because we know you're going to you're going to stay with us do i have a second yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right can we have a vote all those in favor raise your hand all those against raise your hand you I'll, speak, I'll, speak, I'll speak to you later now <laughs> so what i've done <coughs> The certificate. Oh, I'm sure you'll recognise that. Eh? I know that I've seen that badge before. Uh, I don't care whether it's oh, illegal or not. I'm not finding sure that's beautiful. I don't read you what it says. It says, 
Dean Plaza UK Life Membership awarded to Ian Griggs in recognition of his outstanding achievement as Secretary of DP UK, June 2005. I don't know if you can actually see it, you can probably have a look at it later on, but I've taken the D DPD badge and I've added a few extra words in it. <laughs> Dean Plaza UK, Ian Griggs, his motto, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, Seek, Find and Share, Texas, an Essex combined with JJFK <laughs> in the middle. <laughs> and on the back is your new membership card. Oh, very. So you are a life, now a life member. But that is not all. That's just the first part of it. <laughs> <laughs> There's more. <coughs> this comes in uh, two stages. Give me a moment while I sort that. When you first told me that you was going to step down as secretary, I thought, well, A, we've got to mark this event in some way. And I thought, well, how are we going to do it? That's just part of it. The pint would have been enough, Barry. Oh, <laughs> you shut up. <coughs> I thought, I want something to be truly representative of the group. I wanted some I wanted all the group to participate. And not only members of the group but members of all your many friends in the research community. So the idea came to me, why don't I ask him everybody that I could get hold of? Everybody that I knew that you knew, because I don't <laughs> know everybody that you know, you know so many, and ask them to actually personally can contribute. And that's exactly what they've done. I've done it in two ways actually. Number one, we've had a bit of a whip round. In there is a cheque which everybody has contributed to. And we, the idea was to raise enough money to purchase your annual season ticket for the Spurs. And we've, more, we've, we've, we've surpassed it by some significant amount. In fact, enough for you to buy a round of drinks tonight. <laughs> uh, in addition. <laughs> Also, Mark has collected, I think, about $45 from his, his cash. So you've got a cheque there for £320. Oh, come on. And no. some dollars. No. No, no. 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 You are going to accept it. I insist. I absolutely insist. But <laughs> the main thing, I think this, this, this is something which I'm really proud and really pleased with the response that I've got from everybody. It's a scrapbook of memories and anecdotes that most, most of the group have contributed to. I'll sue you. <laughs> you can do what you damn well like. In fact, I'm going to read the introduction. <coughs> this was actually written by, by Chris Robertson. Oh no, not Chris <laughs> Robertson. <laughs> he, he's written, Ian, we present this collection of tributes to you to mark your retirement as Secretary of DD Plaza UK. They come with warmth, respect and affection from your many friends in the group and in the worldwide research community. Even those of us who mistrust the police or don't know our arsenal from our spurs <laughs> have willingly contributed to this document. No coerced statements here. here. None of us have ever met a man like you before. <laughs> we know Thanks. we'll never meet the like of you again and we are proud, very proud, to call ourselves your friends. We hope you enjoy what follows. They are given with warmth, respect and love. All qualities we have experienced from you. Your friends in the DPUK and worldwide Kennedy Assassination Research Community. June 2005. I think at this stage I'm supposed to say something, but I'm lost for words. Well, thank you would be nice. I have given you a kiss. What more do you want? One thing I will I will say. Um, you said there's a check in it for 300, 300 quid. 
Well, believe it or not, I've already got next season seen to get Spurs. Well, that's to reimburse you. But this will certainly go a hell of a long way towards my FF of Dallas this year, yeah. where I'm proud to fly the English flag. So, um, I don't know what to say. I, I, I'm just let me let me look at the this libelous document. <laughs> Oh. Yeah. oh no, this is this is too much. I'm going to I'm going to cry in a minute. I'm, turn that bloody thing off, will you? This is incredible. I mean, Barry, I've never known anything like this before. Well, you're thoroughly serving. Well, I'm. Well, I can't go through. Um, who, who got that one? You. <laughs> <laughs> I was engaged to her. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was engaged to her. Stevenson. <coughs> and I'll kill him. Oh man. So, so, um, I can't possibly go around, I would like to go around and thank you all individuals, I just can't, but um, I'll, I'll collectively thank you very much. I know that you, everyone in this room has contributed to this. Even Bridger, hasn't he? <laughs> Even, <laughs> Even Bridger, yes. <laughs> Mark, I apologise for all the insults. <laughs> only, well, no, only the ones today. I've written yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You've said enough, but <laughs> and this is absolutely. Can I ask who designed this? Was it you? Yours truly. That's tremendous. That's wonderful. I can't. I don't know what to say, people, but I'm just so grateful. But um, all I've done for the last nine years, I've done something that I've enjoyed. I've not done it um, for personal ego reasons, or well, maybe I. But I've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed meeting people. I've enjoyed kicking a few asses. I've enjoyed trying to organise things like this, and. When I handed it over to Barry at the beginning of this year at the AGM, I knew I was handing it over to the right successor. And I know that Barry will carry on the success, the um, tradition, if that's the word, that I like to think I've started. Um, we're 10 years old this year. This, this group is 10 years old this year. Um, I, I don't want to take, the, um, take anything away from other people, but we survived when those people, those Liverpool lot went down. I mean, they, they started this. The people in Liverpool began all this. And we came along and we got in with them. They didn't like us um, and we broke away. Um, they had a massive conference in Liverpool bringing people over from America and it was like Woodstock. The, cli the, the climax, they reached the summit and where can you go from there? Down there. And then they are no longer. And we are. And we can grow further with people like you and the people who can't make this conference for various reasons. We're still active, we're still very much respected in the States, in America, and um, I'm just proud and grateful to have been able to contribute some little part to that, because this shouldn't all come to one person, this is wrong. I would have been absolutely delighted with that, but this other, these other things, they're just, I'm, I can't say too much, I can't say anything, so all I can say is through Barry and directly to you people, thank you, and that's it. Now we're down the You're all invited down to the bar of the pilgrims before they shut. They turn the shut over. Uh, <coughs> you know about this? Yes. You know about this? Hey, man.